J double F Jarrett. <laughs> Here Welcome. we are. Welcome. Here we are. Thank you so much for doing this, man. Really appreciate it. It's an honor and a privilege to have you out. I wanted to call out specifically as we get started. There is a guitar there. So I at the that. end of this, if we really wanted to, you could smash that over Stacy's head. Well, uh, somebody in the room is going to get a guitar shot. <laughs> it, you may be on that <laughs> list, but we won't go there. So, so no. for those that don't know, and I and I'll do my best, but but you're a Hall of Fame wrestler, right? Who for over thirty years, right, performed, and I think you might be still performing. Is that correct? You're being kind. Yes. Okay, uh, thirty-seven years. I started April of eighty-six. Uh, my grandmother, uh, actually here in Nashville, started promoting. Uh, professional wrestling in 1946. Well, she had her first wow. job selling wrestling tickets. So uh, I like to say I'm a third generation um, yeah. uh, sports entertainment is what we call the fancy term now, but professional wrestling, uh, yeah, my family's been in it since 1946. So the Jarrett's have been a part of professional wrestling for 75, 80 years. So. Yeah, and your dad was really involved, you and him together. He was a promoter uh, and a wrestler. Um he started promoting shows uh, actually when he was in high school. Yeah. So it's it's a family business for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, w we have some mutual friends in recovery, and we're going to talk a little bit about recovery and addiction today. And so I, I thought a, just a good place to start would be how you started, you know, professionally and as a function of your recovery. How I started professional wrestling? Sure. Oh, boy. Like I said, family business. Um uh, growing up, um, I was always around it, loved it, just it was my passion. But also, I guess you could say my first true love was basketball. So I played basketball ever since I can remember. Um, played college ball, one year college ball. But uh, we did a uh, – in my high school years, in the summers, I would referee. I helped my grandmother promote, uh, set up the ring, did every odd job you could do in professional wrestling. Um but uh, my plan was to, um, you know, get into professional wrestling at some point, but I was going to play all four years of college ball, and something happened along the way. Uh, I played in the uh, – we were in the uh, tournaments, the college tournaments my freshman year, and uh, my dad and his business partner, um, uh, Jerry Lawler, uh, Hall of Famer as well, uh, came up with an idea to put me in a storyline that was only going to last – a couple of weeks, um, <laughs> and um, it it sort of took off, and um, much to my uh, mother's, uh, uh, she hated it. She absolutely hated it, and we'll get into that because okay. it is okay. a part of my story. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, she wanted me to get my education, and uh, I got into wrestling and didn't go back my sophomore year. It's turned out all right. Uh, I'd but, say. but um, yeah, so I played one year of college ball and then got into professional wrestling in uh, April of 86. So uh, this past April, uh, I celebrated 37 years. So, yes, I'm still active, um, truly by the grace of God. I, I'll get emotional talking about that because logically it doesn't make sense for somebody 56 years of age to be, I'll say, on an active roster, yeah. uh, not any one-off. So. Yeah, that that's it in a nutshell, and I'm just going to give you a heads up. If if hour if a, an hour is our time limit, we're going to go over. I get long winded. Um, anyhow, so we're not worried cool. about that at all. Okay, you know we're here for all the stories, <laughs> and you've you've had a really um, like you mentioned, you've had a really beautiful long career, and it and it and um, it doesn't go past me that it, it is hard work to perform. I mean, how many in, how many nights a year were y'all performing? Uh, you know, when I when I broke in in '86, uh, I wrestled eight times a week, uh, seven days a week, and twice on Saturday. That is, and I did that for seven years. The business has obviously evolved yeah. and changed, yeah. um, but I was on the road uh, since I was 18. We used to wrestle every Monday night in Memphis. This is for my family's promotion. Every Tuesday night uh, in Louisville. Every Wednesday in Evansville, Indiana. Thursday and Friday were armories and high school gyms. Saturday morning, we did TV in Memphis, and Sunday, uh, we did Jackson, Tennessee or whatever, but Saturday night right here in Nashville at the fairgrounds. And an another thing that's kind of, I don't believe in coincidences, only convergences, but uh, exit 201 right down here at 40. Yeah. Um, I left my car there. That was our meeting spot for seven years when we were going to Memphis. So uh, wow. coming from my house in Hendersonville and yeah. getting off of the 201 Charlotte Pike, 
uh, I can't tell you how many times I've done that. So uh, it's pretty cool uh, yeah. p- passing that. So when did you get in with the WWE? So uh, a brief snapshot of my career, and I'll let you dive in anywhere, but yeah. from 86 to essentially 93, I worked for my family's promotion, but I wrestled in Japan and Texas and Puerto Rico, but my home base, home promotion was my the family business. Uh, 93, uh, I went to the WWF for the first time, and I was at – Worked for uh, the McMahons, 93 to 96. Went to Ted Turner's organization, 96 to 97. Went back to the McMahon, uh, the WWF, uh, 97 to 99. And then 99 uh, until March of 2001 when WCW shut down, acquired by their competition, WWF, WCW. Then I founded my, uh, me and my father founded a wrestling organization called uh, TNA Entertainment, TNA Wrestling. That went from 2002 to 2013, then 2014. Um, had another upstart. Which was huge, I just need to say, which was huge <laughs> in the wrestling world. A big deal. So congrats on your all your success there. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, again, we can get into it anywhere, yeah. but I'm just yeah. kind of trying to give you the snapshot. And yeah. then um, a bunch of different things, and then that is truly where, you know, uh, the disease of addiction started to really take hold 2014 and 15 and I went back to the company and we'll get into that, but that's kind of my 30 uh, plus year career. Yeah. So let's start from the beginning in the eighties and I'm curious and you can share as much as you feel comfortable sure. with, but I'm curious about the atmosphere of addiction as you saw it sort of being a young gun, sophomore in college age. So you were 19, 20 years old, right? Yeah. Hitting the road eight times a week. It sounds like for yeah. seven years, every day, <laughs> every day basically. Right living, breathing it. So was that, at that point in your life, um, I guess, was addiction a part of your life at all at that point? Um, the short answer to that is, is is no. I did not truly understand what the disease of addiction was uh, till the age of 50 when I went in. I had no concept of AA. You know, a drinking problem was running out of money. Uh, that's right. when the, it became a problem at the end yeah. of the night. You know, I just, I, I, you know, I had no concept of it right. uh, a, at all. And in the lifestyle uh, of our business, it's a lot of road time, a lot of car time. Uh, when I was 13 or 14, the neighborhood uh, uh, troublemaker um, gave me my first beer, but I hated it. And then I moved it with my dad. My parents were divorced at the age of three, so lived with early part of my life with my mom and then moved out with my dad. Um, the first weekend uh, I moved in with him, again, ran with the wrong crowd, uh, had a couple of beers, got sick, uh, and then I didn't touch a drop of alcohol uh, due to some uh, tough love and discipline, but also I just hated it. And, and I was, um, you know, this side of sobriety, when I kind of look back on it at an early age, I mean, I... Really don't do anything uh, on a five. It's always to a ten. So I literally didn't think about alcohol. Looked down on others that did have in you know in right. high school, and then got into the business, and then uh, you know that that's when I can look at things and know, you know my my drinking uh, was abnormal from day one. Mm. There, there I, I've I've never been. You know, I know all the the language and the you know me and you can speak sure. the same recovery language, uh, so I didn't know that then. But but as I look back on it, I've never been a normal drinker ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could tell you multiple stories on that, but it was for me maybe the macho side of it. What's wrong with these guys? They can't right. handle their alcohol. Can't control it, right? Or, or they right. can't handle their alcohol. You know, yep. it, I just metabolized it different. Uh, and as a young man who was active and working out all the time and on the road all the time. And, you know, just because of the nature of my business, uh, I would never drink before a match or, or at a match as I'd have to be in the car. So my drinking window was really about 11 o'clock at night to about 1, 1 1.30. And then it's time to go to bed and get up the next day. That, right. that was it. So, uh, but at an early age, um, my alcohol consumption was not normal, but I just wasn't aware. Right, right. Well, you know, and based on the nature of your business, again, which is tough physically, mm-hmm. I mean, you're throwing, your body is being thrown around for decades. Yeah. So I would imagine that at some point, potentially a part of your story was pain management, right? I mean, 
I'm, is that true or not I, true? No, I'm actually uh, maybe one of the lucky ones uh, that, but, you know, pills rampant in our industry, well, in society, you know, we yeah, can go right, to right, all, all that, right, but in our right. industry, um, super rampant, lots and, I mean, it's it's tragic, a lot of deaths yeah. uh, due to that, but I was... Um, as a guy that took uh, hydrocodone and would itch, and I just hated pills. I got you. Uh, I, I, I never smoked. I, you know, I can't say that I never, but that was not my <laughs> drug of choice. I yeah. just, I couldn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like it make the way me feel, uh, like felt. So that wasn't my deal either. Yeah. Um, but uh, alcohol was. Yeah. And, and that was something that, you know, you, you get out of the ring with the adrenaline going and and pumping and jumping a car and drive home and then later uh you know after the show you get to a hotel bar and then you know it closes at 1 one thirty or 2 and then you go to bed and rinse and repeat and you're out the door the next day to the next show but uh yeah alcohol was always my drug of choice yeah i'd say that's a miracle because i'm sure you're i mean from what i know from the pro wrestling community is it's it's tough. It's a tough business, and it, especially for somebody like you who's had a lifetime of success, which you were alluding to earlier. Like, I mean, keeping up your body yeah. to perform like that is not a small feat. It's a big deal, and there's a lot of guys who are struggling with chronic pain. Yeah, struggling, and and that's where you know um, I think my genetic makeup. Yeah, uh, and also uh, the part of the brain I'm again don't do anything, and that's probably. It is a character defect that I don't do anything, you know, on a five. It's 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 a one or a ten. But I was always fanatical about staying in shape and drinking my water and eating healthy and, and all that, you know, I will yeah. get into my story about being admitted as we walked through the halls, you know, when I got admitted into detox, you know, they were like, There's no way. There's no way you're drinking that much liquor. Right. And I said, well, ask me about the rest of my day when I'm, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so yeah. that's the kind of the positive side of it is that I've always stayed in shape and stretched and worked out. So let me ask you this. There's something I'm always curious with with somebody like you who's famous, right, and a performer. Um, how did that impact your identity? So I'm, I'm still talking early years, 80s and 90s, yep. you know, 2000s, you know, that, that this – Fame, night in, night out, television, you know, again, JFF, you know, you were at the top of the mountain and obviously a Hall of Fame career. And I'm wondering, kind of from an addiction perspective, how how did that impact who you were as a person? Or or do you have any insight on that? Because thousands of fans night in and night out screaming your name, recognizing you on the street. I mean, that's got to have an impact on you as the human, the human being, Jeff Jarrett. You want to get deep here? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll try to walk you through this. Yeah. That component of the fame and the fortune and all this, because my dad wrestled and promoted, and I was around wrestlers as a little kid, and my grandmother and my grandmother used to have a saying uh, that I say on my podcast this time to time. She told me at an early age, you can wrestle, but don't become a wrestler. And that mm. really meant don't let fame and fortune, don't mm. be an idiot, don't go blow your money. Mm. You know, just kind of the superstardom of it. But to to go back a little bit uh, uh, from a rewind, um, like I referenced, my parents got divorced when I was three. Very, very bitter divorce. Um, both of my parents. I just lost my dad in February this year, and my mom mm. a few years prior to that. Sorry for your loss. I never, thank you. I never saw them have a civil conversation in my life. Um, and so, you know, being around my mom and her family, uh, they would always talk bad about my dad. And being around my dad's right. family, they're going to talk bad about mom. So at a very early age, uh, a big part of my story is, is I can put on a mask. Now, in wrestling, I'm wearing the mask. But as a little kid, I learned to wear a mask, that I could get along in any environment, um, no matter what it was, whether you call it the chameleon or – but I, I learned to wear a mask and – you know, in my teenage years, it was a certain set of masks. And then when I got into my business, we're show business. It's scripted entertainment. It's very physical. We beat the hell out of each other. But at the end of the day, it's not true sport. It It is flamboyant acting. 
uh, again, very physical. But again, a part of that mask, I, 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 I was acting at nine or ten years of age, yeah. and and that really served me well in my industry. But as the years rolled on, those different masks got me more and more sicker, as we say, with the disease of addiction because, you know, you start self-medicating. And although there's some pain, you know, th through all that, and, you know, at a very early age, that's what really began to affect me as I look through that lens, which you talked. Yeah. So the fame and fortune didn't bother me, but um, the acceptance, you know, my mom never watched me wrestle live, you know, mm. thousands or millions watch it on TV. Right. My mom never attended one event and really hated the industry of what I was in. I didn't understand it at the time. Getting sober, I understand in her eyes the business uh, is to blame. That's what broke up that marriage. So anything that having to do with that business, right? So, so but again, it's that that family unit, that deep seated yeah. stuff that 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 really goes into peeling the layers of the onion back on the disease of addiction. Is is because you mentioned your addiction really took off later in life. Yes. So what's fascinating about what you just said is, from an early age, you know, the destruction of your parents' relationship and how you observed that, learning to wear a mask, and then from a fame and performance perspective and who you were and your professional identity, literally wearing a mask. And it wasn't until maybe the backside of that that you had to start reconciling with the fact that. These masks aren't working for me anymore. Yeah, which is really, yeah, so kind of makes sense if you think about it. Oh, I, and again, I'm you know, um, I do my daily routine, and yeah. if I'm in town, uh, I'm at a meeting. Uh, so I work. In a lot of ways, recovery is my passion now because mining for limitless gold is the real deal. Uh, but when I got into treatment and I went to Tampa and I'm a little jealous walking around the grounds here today, my counselor um, and my wife uh, both agreed. I really didn't have a say, although I thought I had a say is, Jeff, you live in Nashville. You're not going to treatment in Nashville. We're right. going to get you out of the environment, sure. which I respect. Uh, beautiful place out here. But, Thank you. Thank you. Um, getting into treatment, everything happened exactly the way it's supposed to, but working with individual counselors and and getting in a room and getting white paper and let's let's don't start last year let's don't even start five years ago let's go back to your earliest memories and I can remember literally illustrating and writing and drawing from my earliest members all the way up and when I had that opportunity to really do the work it was so clear on how the disease of addiction just put me two feet in the grave. Yeah. I was, you know, I was no doubt about it. I was headed for death. Yeah. So let's talk about you getting sober. You know, you've alluded to it several times. So what was the event? Why, why did you go to this treatment center in Tampa? Oh boy. We're skipping through a lot there. No. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of, of uh, how to put this concisely. So October 25th, 2017 is my sober date. Yeah. Um, Labor Day. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Labor yeah. Day weekend of 2017, I was in Mexico and um, had a bad incident. All my drinking, wanted to fight everybody in the dressing room. It was just a – I was a complete mess. I came home from that and my business partner – and my wife and others basically kind of said, you need help. Um, just look at it. And like a true addict who's active does, okay, I'll show you guys. Right. I'll go get the help. Right. And I did. I went out to a hunt club, um, satellite office for, for Cumberland Heights, and went through IOP, uh, did my marching orders from – 8 to 11.30 every day, have my notepad. I was the best note taker in every class. Uh, <laughs> when I left at 11.30, the guys who'd been in a little bit long say, hey, do you want to go down to the noon meeting? Yeah, I'll meet y'all there. Never went to a meeting, took notes, went th through all of that. Um, actually drank one time during the IOP, and I'll never forget. His name is Larry Dickens. He's passed away. I went in and had my entire story ready 
because uh, I drank on a Sunday during IOP and went in Monday morning and, you know, hey, we're, we're taking a, a test today, a urine test, and, man, I had my story ready and all this, and he just sat down and said, like great counselors do, hey, man, it's up to you. I'll never forget, like, wait a minute, he ain't even mad. You right. know, I didn't understand right. it, but I did understand. Okay. Right. Anyway, that happened, and then um, uh, got out of, uh, um, uh, you know, the IOP and was going to, quote, unquote, get my life back on track. And uh, I was headed to Canada, had a wrestling appearance up in Canada, flew from Nashville to Minneapolis, um, supposed to have a whatever 90 minute layover I went in the lounge was doing my work no big problem one and a half hour lay goes into a two and a half hour delay goes into whatever it is and and finally we get to the gate so everybody's stressed am I going to make the show and other people are you know whatever it was like normal travel um, and got on the plane and they rushed to board us and the stewardess walked by me and said you know, Mr. So-and-so, can I get you something? All this, And the stewardess came to me, Mr. Jarrett, can I get you something? I said, yeah, I'll take a double rum and Dr. Pepper. Literally, that was with not even thinking. I just spent two and a half hours in a lounge and and didn't think about it. Drank more coffee and water and answered emails and all this kind of stuff, but got on that plane. She asked. I didn't even, it didn't even yep. register. Yep. Uh, that, just autopilot. That's what we do. It's what we do. It's what we do. And that was uh, the beginning. That was on a Friday um, of a four-day bender that um, it was unbelievable. You know, it, when I look back on it, there's no reason I'm really alive. Yeah. Uh, three encounters with cops, um, you know, got, flew to Canada, crossed the border, came back through the <laughs> through the border. Right. Uh, flew home, uh, got in my car. Um, decided to play an adult game of hide and go seek with my wife in my car. She's not going to find me. It, it just, you know, a true four day bender. Um, and this is something that I still cannot explain today, other than it, it was God speaking through me or for me, probably for me. Um, uh, you know, Karen came in from getting the kids off, and and just, you know, it was just I had no relationship with any of my kids, so to speak. Five kids, uh, certainly. My you know, my wife Karen was, you know, way at the end of her rope, um, and you know, she she walked in, and I'm sitting in my chair with the Today Show on, and just half out of it. Still, obviously, a, a boatload of uh, alcohol in my system, but I wouldn't have called myself drunk at all. Sure, yeah. Um, You're trying to get normal. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and she's just like, what in the hell are you going to do? Mm. And, Nick, I responded just like I responded on the plane uh, without thinking. I said, I'm going to treatment. Um, and she just looked at me, and she's like, okay. And she went in the next room and called some friends and put the wheels in motion and they kept asking her to go ask me, is he really going to go? Yeah. How this, is he really going to yeah, go? Yeah, yeah. So about the third or fourth time, um, I can joke about it now, but I gave my wife um, a very, very good wrestling promo in the fact that if you ask me one more time, but I was adamant. <laughs> I was going. Yeah, yeah. And I really don't know why. But I think, you know, I was saying I was sick and tired of being sick and tired mm. uh, so much. But, um, again, it, it was um, – I was at that headspace, the bottom of the barrel. I really had nowhere else to look but up because I couldn't explain on a Monday morning why I drank four days before. Right. I couldn't explain why I went to the liquor store, you know, I mean, drank up and, you know, up and back from Canada, landed, go to a liquor store, go to a liquor store again. Yeah. You, you know, that's just, that's insanity. I mean, yeah. the disease of addiction <laughs> affects the way you think. And uh, as we know in step two, return to sanity. I, um, I got a full dose of understanding that step. Well, you know what you remind me of is that um – um you know, for an alcoholic or an addict living clean or sober, they're living in, we're living in an abnormal state. Oh, yeah. Sober and clean, right? And so that autopilot, you know, 
somebody doesn't become addicted or, or become an alcoholic overnight, right? It's a process, not an event. And it's not, you know, you don't wake up one day as a kid thinking, you know, I'm going to be a police officer or a firefighter or, a, or an alcoholic. That's, that's not how that works. But these small little decisions yeah. that serve us, the mask is one of those emotionally and spiritually and these drugs that and alcohol that work. They work in the beginning, right? In the beginning for a second, and then they don't. And you go on a lifetime ride of degradation. Yeah. Sounds like you did and had your experience. And um, I got a little emotional thinking about that moment of you sitting in your chair watching the Today Show. Like, I know what those moments are like. And so do many people here, you know, of like just being sick and tired of being sick and tired and knowing I don't have another option, you know, so let's go and do this. Yeah. And when you, I bet when you made that decision, it was decision made. Yeah, the, the the thing not to stay sober for the rest of your life, because I don't think you had any. I didn't you have know, any none concept of that. Of that. Yeah, I right. didn't have any concept. Of that. I just knew um, I got to Something's got to change. Yeah, S something's got to change. I mean, even <laughs> so, uh, I've shared this obviously in my home group, but making that decision and adamant about it, and you know. I can't tell you how many times in my house, a uh, like all active al alcoholics, the family throws it away or hides it or yeah. whatever it may be. But out back of my house by my pool, I've got a little refrigerator. And um, I don't know, that afternoon came, I'm going to go have me a beer. Yeah. So I go out there, come back in. My wife never said nothing. Go out there, have another one. Never said nothing. About the third time, she's like, "You're supposed to keep drinking. You're going to keep drinking till you get to to Florida." And I just went. She goes, "Yeah, you don't need to start detox until you get down there." And I just was like, "Okay." But it was a realization that, of course, any family member is going to say, "Would you just quit drinking, right. please?" Okay. In my mind, Jeff's sick because they're saying just he doesn't need to get out of hand. Mm -mm. Just, you know, so. We don't need to take this upon ourselves. My to education to out. started without me, me even knowing about the disease of addiction and getting to treatment. I had a lot of things that I loved about it. It was the greatest 56 days truly of my life. I wouldn't be here today without it. But the medical class that we had there, you know, we have process and family and all the different things. But we had a medical class that really opened my eyes to to really drill down in the aha moments that went off in my life. That how I dealt with my best friend in wrestling uh, fell eighty two feet to his death, and how I processed that. I mean, I put on a mask that next that night. Oh, okay, you know, I never would emotionally mm -hmm. uh, process anything. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, getting to treatment and understanding the medical component that it's a disease, it affects the part of the brain that makes decisions. So, okay, if it starts right there, so I consciously would make a decision or maybe subconsciously because I've done it so long. If anything happens in my world, don't really feel it. What am I going to do? I'm going to figure out and go in my closet and pick out the very best mask that I know how to to walk through my life so a friend's death okay i'm going to be a tough guy i'm okay my first wife passed away of breast cancer okay i I'm, i feel sorry for her but what do i really need to do oh i need to be the best dad so i'm gonna it, that you know th that in in wrestling i mean i could go on and on but i really learned in treatment that component of um the the mask i even wore mask before my higher power you know i just had a wrong mindset of of who my god is uh, maybe said better who who he was who he is and who he will be uh and that that all those type things just they just have radically changed my life that's an incredible story you know and i the mask analogy is uh pretty useful <laughs> yeah. in this case i mean perfect for you, you yeah know, we talk yeah. about in our literature literally the masks must go but yeah, in this case, it was yeah. in all ways, you know. And so, based on what you shared in your life, I mean, it's wrestling served so many purposes for you. Oh yeah. As you moved through life, as life happens, you know. Um, 
and having recovery introduce you to the idea that, hey, you know what? It's time for Jeff to be his genuine, authentic, and vulnerable self, and we're going to have to discover that together is um, an interesting process. And scary as hell, I would imagine, the first time you started reconciling that down in Tampa. Oh, I cried more in Tampa than I had in my previous 35, since I was 10, 11, you know, yeah. all that. The one thing that um, you were talking about how wrestling um, – Lost my train of thought. We were talking. Um, Wrestling was a perfect mask. It's the whole process. Oh, so yes, that, and then the 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 a sister to that thought is our business is obviously ego driven. It's all me, me, me. You know, it, it's yeah. just how it's portrayed. It's all all focused. I'm the champ. I'm going to kick your ass. It, it's all yeah. ego, ego, ego. And, and kind of taking a step back and hearing service work and humility and get outside of yourself. Uh, you know, happiness is truly a byproduct. Because I think in our very core, little Jeff at three, four, five, six years, all he really wanted to do was be happy. Well, then all of a sudden, okay, how's he going to achieve that happiness? Okay, I'm going to work the main events. I'm going to buy the nicest car, the nicest house. Uh, I'm going to have the most friends. I'm going to do this. All me, 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 me. But hearing the stories in the rooms and you hear, I'm, again, the, when you hear those phrases, happiness is a byproduct? What are you talking about? I know how to be happy. Well, I had proved enough to myself over 50 years. I didn't know a damn thing about how to really be happy. And so getting outside of yourself and and really doing we call it service work, but doing mm -hmm. for others something that they have no chance of paying you back. You start doing little wins like that, and you go, "Wow, mm -hmm. I, I, th that is a good feeling." That that you know, so those kind of things. It, it's it's the little losses that I had over the thirty years that got me in the grave. You start flipping that around and get little win after little win after little win. Um, it's a whole new way of life. Yeah, you start to rebuild a positive sense of self that's grounded in your ability. You know, it's like um, to gain self-esteem, you have to do esteemable acts, you know, and it's the same way with your spiritual condition or mine, excuse me. Yep. Yeah, yeah, my yeah. spiritual condition as a recovering addict, you know, I began my recovery journey 13 years ago at 20. So I had some identity work right off the bat. You lucky we don't need son to get, of a gun. <laughs> I don't, it's not about me, but yeah. I know that those little steps that you talk about, those little wins, you know, being a sponsor, you know, working through the steps all the way, chairing a meeting, and then and then other things that come in life, you know, ha having a, having a child, becoming a dad, yeah, and doing that sober, you know, and you're like, wow, you know, I that gives me a positive sense of self that's not grounded in the amount of money that I make or this award I received or. Uh, Ego. Whose head I cracked over a, a yeah. guitar, right? Yeah. And all that stuff. So when I think about your story and I think about little Jeff at three learning real quick, if I might say, emotions aren't safe. And like you said, what do I need to do? I'm going to become a champ. You know, I'm going to become a champion, mm -hmm. right? And I'm going to, and it's just the mask after mask after mask after mask. It's almost like your life prepared you for sobriety all the way through. Oh, there's no doubt. You know, our promise you know is we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on yeah. it. It's, I, I still get amazed when I kind of think through and your events director, Stacy Bridges, probably laughs at me in meetings, but I'll <laughs> sit in meetings, especially during the, the, the you know, uh, how it works, traditions. But on the promises, when I'll close my eyes and I'll kind of think through, as people are saying, is uh, written 80 years ago, how it's divine intervention. You know, how they wordsmith the exact words that when you sit and process it, you know, um, God's going to do for us. What, you know, I, I would have called that, and I, well, I didn't know it enough to call it hogwash, but in IOP, I'm just like, what are what, these what folks the talking, talking about? about? Yeah. And it's as true. I mean, it's unbelievable. It yeah. truly is. I'm a, a kid in a candy store sometimes you know, in, in the rooms and being around others because you just go, wow, that is truly God working right here. Yeah. 
one of the things I'll say for just anybody that's listening to your story, because we might get some people that are listening just because of who you were professionally. And it's, it's, I'm excited for the, thank you for sharing everything that you shared and, you know, because getting to know the person, Jeff Jarrett, is different than the champion Hall of Fame wrestler, <laughs> right? And and so for I the, hope it, so. If no. there's anybody that's listening to this, what I'll say about about recovery too is that we, I, and and the people that I am around that are in recovery, we often have a lot of contempt prior investigation about what in exactly hell is going on here. Yeah. yeah. You know, and um, recovery is an active change of our ideas mm-hmm. and our attitudes. And it takes time for some of that to take root. But you don't need to worry about that. I don't need to worry about that. I have 24 hours in front of me, yeah. right? And I just need to make the next decision. And sometimes that is you coming to me and saying, hey, Nick, I think the best thing for you to do today is not drink. And maybe you should come to a meeting with me. Yeah. That's the only thing I need to worry about. But it is so hard to let go and surrender all of that because it feels like I'm surrendering for the rest of my life and what is all this going to mean? And Overwhelming. It's overwhelming. That was something really big for me. Um, and again, w- w- you know, you got sober at 20. Yeah. I got sober at 50. So when I see young people in the room, you can just feel the weight of the world on their shoulders. It's much easier for me, not hit them over the head with it, but just say, hey, come here. Let me talk about something. You know, and I, I was 50 and was facing lawsuits from my business partners, my wife and my relationship on the rocks, five kids. They wanted nothing to do with me. It was just a complete tornado of my, of my life. And I would get out and, you know, you get home from Tampa and, um, you know, so, so, okay. Yeah, what was it like yeah, getting that, home after it, those 56 days? Um, th- that is where... Boy, I'm gonna sound like a. I'm definitely gonna sound like a salesman here. <laughs> but the wellness program at the WWE. Um, I was gonna ask you about like, that. like you guys and like any yeah. r- real process, um, the aftercare that that you know, 56 days. Eight, it's easy to stay sober when you're talking at 18 hours a day. I didn't know that now, but that that's the reality. You get home and I'm talking to a counselor once a week. And have you found a home group? Have you found a sponsor? Like really diving in and the analogies that we hear, you know, it took me 32 years to walk into this forest because I started really drinking regularly at 18. So 50 years, so 32, you know, it's like, what? I'm like, it doesn't take 32 to get out, but trust me, sure. it took you a while. You know that the one yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah. But just kind of the 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 mental space. Uh, again, I'm a routine guy, but every morning I wake up at five, so from 5:30 uh, till a little before seven. I'm late to my meeting sometimes, but anyway, the first 90 minutes of my day, or or for work on Jeff, and I, that was kind of ingrained in me at treatment. Um, and then my counselor, and they're just kind of observing. And then if you get into stoicism philosophy or if you get into tapes and whatever it may, even in business, you know, how am I going to work on Jeff, which I never did before? A, my ego, I don't need working on. B, uh, I'll tell you how to do it. I don't need – just the whole ego part of it. <laughs> but but really drilling down and, and processing things and that simplistic mindset of – Okay, you know, because the lawsuits were weighing on me and repairing my kids' relationships, uh, you know, teenage girls. It's it just all, all, it just it was it was it was many a morning. It was incredibly overwhelming for me because now I'm not drinking and I can't cover it up and I can't medicate it. But I really yep. got to look at the last thirty years of my life, professionally, all kinds of successes, personally. I mean, I beat myself up over and over and over, but kind of the one thing that I could always go back to at the, my morning kind of, and I still do it today. I did it today. What am I going to do between now and when I lay my head back on that pillow tonight? That's That truly is the only thing that is in my mind space when I get done with my morning because if I get it too far outside of that, I get myself in trouble. But what I found is putting a couple of days 
of success together. What a incredible kind of way to live that, um, you know, you don't get agitated. It's just living in that 24 hours a day headspace. Uh, the fruits of that are immeasurable. Yeah. It's one of the most important things. I'll tell you a little story because, um, so I'm an NA guy. It doesn't matter. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I subscribe to the, you know, go to a meeting. Yeah. You know, I don't care what meeting it is, where it is. I'm, go. Go to a meeting. <laughs> yeah. Right. So in particular though, I was, I kind of was quote unquote raised in recovery in NA and, and, in one of our books, there's a whole chapter dedicated. And the, ch- the title of the chapter is called Just for Today. It's a whole chapter dedicated on living in the moment. And uh, many, many of my lessons, because I grew up. I mean, I, I'm 34. I turned 34 yesterday, by the way. Happy birthday, boy. And um, I only say that because my team made a way too big of a deal about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've grown up in recovery, I guess is what I'm trying to yep. say. And so these lessons about how to live in the moment and how important it is like you, when you're talking about your 90 minutes in the meeting, I'm feeling my feet on the ground. And it's reminding me about, you know, I'm not going to worry about what's going to happen three hours from now. Yeah. Or next week I have this meeting with this group. That, that, that Certainly we can take responsibility for the th- great things and things we need to take care of in our life, but how important it is to be in the here and now, you know, and how when I got sober and clean, it was really difficult to turn my brain off. You know, it was always running and gunning, beating myself up, sending me messages about not being good enough. It's always, the ego is funny. It's you're always not good enough or too good. Insecure Never egomaniac. E- that's it. That's <laughs> it. Right. An egomaniac with no self-esteem. Right. Yeah. That was me. And so when I hear you and and uh, uh, you going back home and shout out Karen, yeah. <laughs> sounds like a great wife and a great person. I know she is. We have some mutual friends, but sounds like you had laid that groundwork to begin to open that door into recovery into your day-to-day life, you know, and it really took off. Yeah. I mean, again, I'll give her even more a shout out, but, she, you know, um, my counselor would kind of give her, I'll call it the Al-Anon yeah. uh, flavor of it, is that he needs this space. He need, you know, as a spouse and all that. Well, she's done the work too. And, and you know, three weeks before... I quit drinking or went into treatment. Karen had been sick and tired of being sick and tired, mainly for me, but she's just like, I'm done. I, I'm, I, I'm at least not going to drink around him or I'm done. But she hadn't picked up a drop of alcohol so since then. So, Whoa, so, so, wow. So that, that's, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. you know, I learned in treatment, you can, you can say either I'm lucky or God's get me, showed me a lot of grace or our family under grace, but she quit drinking as well, but the sober mentality, not just no alcohol, just kind of that sober mindset, mm-hmm. and he's going to go work on himself, and just, oh, wow. And, you know, my youngest daughter, mm. Mm. this gets me every time. We were going to school, and something came up. And I'm taking her to school, and she said something. I don't even remember, but I remember this. She said, you know, Dad. I said, no, I'm not following. She goes, you're just different. Mm. And I'm like, well, what do you mean, Jer? She said, well, you're just not the same person since you came back from Tampa. And that kind of stuff that you go as a dad, like, oh, my God, you know. Yeah. It's it, it, it's something. It's one of those things that you go. Because to me, yeah, I'd quit drinking, but how, how does she know? You know, she's seventh grade at this point. How does she really? But she saw that. So the effect that it can have on family members uh, is never lost on me. And you know, time takes time and all that. But um, yeah, just just the that was a big win. But you know, just just having. Uh, just having those moments is is really what I be, you know began to feel in early sobriety that that just continued to change me to this day. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. You know, you have those interactions with, and it might even be you know a family member reaching out to you and saying, "Hey, I got a drinking problem." 
two years, three years, four years down the road or whatever it is, or your child saying, you've changed that, that, or your parents or whoever it is, that stuff. Can I tell you a funny story? Please do. Because the flip side of that, my seventh grade daughter said that. Uh, Here we go. I've been sober about two, two and a half years. Yeah. And my life had begun to get a couple of 24s, as we say. It got better and better and better and better and better. And my dad was at the house one day and... Hey, what do you got planned? What are you doing here? Bun bun. You know, Karen's like, well, he'll get up at the crack of dawn and he'll do all this and he'll go to his meeting and do this and we'll meet y'all, all this. And he goes, son, do you still go to meetings? Right. And I learned this, but I replied, dad, do you still bathe? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and he literally went, oh. Click. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's one of the things that I, I never want to lose um, mm-hmm. kind of that mindset that, you know, folks that are, whether it's family members or patients here or whoever is listening to this, um, I have the disease of addiction. Uh, it's maybe the single greatest disease that you can have. And the reason I say that is, is that I have the opportunity every day to take my medicine. It's up to me. Cancer, nah. heart disease, diabetes, and we could go through the whole list. That's, you know, it's, it's you, you, you don't have the opportunity sometimes, no matter how bad That's right. you want that cancer to go away or heart disease. Or in, in, in the disease of addiction, we've got an opportunity. And as we all know, you, you got to do the work. Right. It, it, it's, it's, well, some people say, you know, the disease of addiction is the most complex psychological disorder in the world because of that fact. Yeah. If you really think about it, because look, multiple personalities, you either got it or you don't, right? If your doctor said, hey, you need to stop eating bananas and you won't experience multiple personalities, well, guess what? Huh. You're never going to eat a banana again. Most of us. Maybe there would be a few, but. You're right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with addiction, the element of choice, right? And I, I'm not of the, I don't know where addiction comes from. I don't know how you get it, how you don't get it. I, I don't I don't pretend to know the answer to these questions, but I do know that if you do experience it and you feel like you're in that gray zone, that we have a solution. Yep. Right? And I know based on my experience professionally working here and the t- 2,000 lives that we get to touch every year and the people that we meet along the way and the meetings that we go to that – those people that are actively participating in the middle of the boat, generally speaking, they yeah. thrive yeah. and they survive. And yeah, I want to make sure that I don't get too far on my skis because, you know, the literature that says there are some. That's right. We yeah. don't have explanation of why that tragically they don't get it. Yeah. I don't. And I get those questions all the time. You know, somebody. I think about that often because in treatment, and I don't know, and, and the, yeah. the medical yeah. uh, experts said, look, this is r- rough numbers, but I'm of the mindset that we, you're either born with a gene or not. Uh, you know, you, you either have that gene that you can become a uh, an addict, alcoholic or not. But out of that group, you know, they say only one or nine, one out of nine has yeah. that gene. Out of that group. Only one of those nines dies sober. That that's that's a real reality. So I, right. I know it's it's there's no such thing as guaranteed success. No, there's not. And we try here, just like any other, I think, uh, reputable provider network is. You know, we try to get people access to a recovery um, trajectory. It's kind of like the language. So, so you might experience relapse, like you do with cancer, right? You might have a relapsing instance, right? But Let's get you back on track. Yeah. You know, because relapse is a part of a lot of people's stories, but it doesn't have to be. Right. And I, you know, I was alluding to, I've had many, many, even some great friends who've died from the disease of addiction and just, Nick, why don't you think they got it? And I said, you know, I don't pretend to know that the answer to that question. Yeah. Right. But what happened was tragic and that person's in a better place now. But, but again, what I do know is that for me, it's it, what I tell people, it's like a diet, you know, like. If you're going to be on the carnivore diet, you're going to be a vegan, that works for you, great. I just choose 
to not drink or use any mood altering mind changing drugs, right? Yeah. Cause every time I do, I end up breaking out in handcuffs and it's a real, <laughs> it's a real, it's a real problem, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. And so it works for me. Um, I want to ask you, I'll, I'll kind of want to shift gears a little bit because I'm real curious about this. You alluded to, so I'm thinking about other people who have, who put on the mask still today professionally. And I, you alluded to a wellness program in the WWE and I'm curious today, what's the culture of support around recovery um, and what kind of resources are provided to pro wrestling with addiction? I mean, I work at All Elite Wrestling right uh, right now, uh, owned by the Khan family. What's it called? Uh, All Elite Wrestling. Okay. A AEW yeah, Wrestling. Yeah, yeah. I just so, wanted you to say it clearly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, All Elite Wrestling. But WWE and AEW, and WWE is a publicly traded company. They're, uh, you know, they've, they've had the wellness program 20 years or so, and it's, um, you know, uh, by the grace of God, they, they were there uh, when Karen called. Um, AEW, private That's company. Awesome. Um, you know, that things are done much more, um, you know, uh, it, it, on a case by case basis, but they are, they go above and beyond taking care of folks that need help. I mean, there's no doubt. Uh, Shad Khan owns the Jacksonville Jaguars, Fulham win the Premier League. So they're very aware of, you know, the, the sports teams and all that. But um, the one thing that I think a lot like society that, uh, mental health, the disease of addiction, it's much more uh, out in the open now. It's not a four-letter word. The yeah. education comes along. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I won't mention my friends. But they know who they are, but I'll keep yeah. that. But, but there's a lot of us that, um, you know, uh, it goes with saying like, wait a minute. He ain't drinking 10 years. You know, one of those deals. But right. it's the hope. You know yeah. uh, that okay, this guy got sober, and this guy. There's a lot of us that that talk about it. Um, we're there for each other, but there's a network uh, of of folks in our industry um, that have gotten sober and stayed sober, and just like any other recovery uh, group, we have our folks that relapse and go back out, and you know they consistently come back in with the same story not one of them have said man guys i just had the greatest relapse in the world y'all want to try it no they, you know they always Never come happens. back in yep. and and it always gets worse and they always kick themselves but you know hopefully we're there as a group to say hey, man th that's part of it you know yeah. is there any um just by way of our organization or any individual that might be listening to this is there any way for us to support either AEW or the WWE? Is there a fund? Is there, how do people get access to treatment? How does that happen? What can we do? Uh, you know what? I, uh, now that I'm out here, but there is, um, y you know, it, it is such an individual. Okay. Th there's a group of us that, that you know, maybe we can, I can come back with a better answer on that and really think that through. But, you know, guys that end up, um, that's kind of the one thing about our industry is that we're, Part sports team and also kind of part rock and roll band, um, and it's a it's a it's a at times a nasty mix. But but there is, you know, we have no secrets for the most part. And when we when there's guys that, you know, have a problem, um, they're addressed, they're spoken to. Hey man, can we help you? So that's the good thing about yeah over the last twenty years. And and look, you can Google. Unfortunately, you know, Google dead wrestlers. I mean, it's mm. incredible mm. the list of names that come up, and um, you know, the the pills that 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 jumped on just like society. It mirrored society that when when the pills became rampant, it 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 was a path of destruction in our industry. Uh, the upside is it's not near as prevalent anymore. Uh, I think the schedules are much more conducive. I think the organizations have learned from the grind of the past. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of guys are much more health-minded anyway. Right. It's a generational uh, deal as well that, you know, people talk about the 60s and 70s and how things change in the 80s and 90s. And so uh, thankfully um, – our industry doesn't have, and I can say this as a vet, 37 years, the drug use 
it is radically changed. And that's a great, great positive. Absolutely. I think you're right. And well, I'm not a pro wrestler <laughs> or anything like that. Come on, you can be. I no. could, I, <laughs> maybe after this, like I said, we have a guitar, yeah, we yeah. have the whole thing. But um, unfortunately, Cumberland Heights hasn't seen a big change. You know, we still treat as many people. In fact, we probably treat more people than we ever have before. But That's a good I, thing. It's a good thing that we're here. But the cult, our culture seems to be shifting to be, <laughs> seems to be shifting in some ways to be more health minded. Okay. Or folks seem to be, um, I will say this, the folks that we treat seem to be more educated than they ever have before about what they're doing, about the drugs that they're taking. And a part of that, I think, is some fear. We don't need to get into, but fentanyl. Yeah, fentanyl is really in a negative way because people are dying left and right like they <sighs> never had before. But fentanyl has really changed the game in your awareness of what am I taking and where did this come from? Because with these pill presses, you have no idea. But there's but there is some good news. There is legislation that's I know Mississippi just passed a law because um, uh, these fentanyl test wipes. And it's a long story, but where you can actually wipe the pill or whatever it is that you're going to take to make sure it doesn't have fentanyl in it. Because some in some states, that's illegal to have access to these wipes, which is just crazy. So um, it, it's just when I think back on, you know, our industries, yeah, it's just the game yeah, has changed. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you for being here. You're always no, welcome you. at Cumberland Heights. And I want to particularly, it's easy for me to tell my story. Right. And I just want to give you some credit and some props in that, you know, you've made an intentional decision and you're probably going to brush it off, but you made an intentional decision to tell your story, not just on this podcast, but in your life yeah. since 2017. And I think it really matters. And I think you're helping people, um, you know, take the pressure off of the stigma that we carry around that I'm different or I don't belong or I'm struggling with something that nobody struggles with. So it, it really matters, Jeff. Thanks for helping our people. No, I, I mean, it's one of those things that if I do autograph sessions, um, even, you know, on social media, uh, just different things um, that, you know, our 12th edition attraction rather than a promotion, I post once a year about my sobriety, and that's my chip. That's the only time I really b b post about it. But, but living it day in and day out um, – they some folks joke with me in my home group in my meetings because I always use the word paradoxical, but that was such a revelation. Oh wait, she's, they're, they're laughing over there. Yeah, yeah. Did she tell yeah, you that? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> but I just found it so fascinating because we're born into the world, and I always like to give this analogy: as little babies, we cry when we're hungry, or cry when we need our diaper changed, and we cry when we want to go to sleep. And how does that kind of get cured? The world does it. The world feeds us. Our mom bathes us. Our mom rocks us to sleep. So as little children, we kind of grow into teenagers, and we just have different fits to get our food, to get comforted, to get our rest and all, you know, just all that. And then for me and, and other addicts, as you get in your 20s and your 30s, the, the 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 me 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 take 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 mindset uh, doesn't really change. We're all acting like kids. I was a fifty year old kid, but just kind of that main mindset. Well, in in the big big book in the Word, you know, it clearly states about growing up, and so you know, <laughs> gr growing up and 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 really, what well, what is that growing up? So my life is driven by love and service, and so. I've been given the gift of sobriety. Without sobriety, I'm dead. I, I'm not even here to think about an autograph session or seeing my kids play ball or taking my wife out to dinner. None of that happened. I mean, it's I'm dead. It's that's not kind of saying. I, yeah. The funeral happened and they came in Hendersonville and yeah. oh man, he's a pretty good wrestler, but yeah. he just couldn't quit drinking. That's a reality. So this side of sobriety, I really do try to have the mindset of if I can help one person, that's that's the real uh, message of one person. You you can do this, and and that's going back to my paradoxical word. And I'll shut up. I told you I'd be long winded. The 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 give it away to keep it is okay. So Jeff, how are you going to give it away? 
How am I going to give it away today? Uh, because if I don't, just what it says, I believe our literature uh, probably more, more. I mean, it, it, I drive some family members crazy, but it, but you know, <laughs> the big big book it clearly states it. It's it's very obviously it's derived from that. But I That's I'm right. a big believer in. Um, how am I going to keep it? How am I going to stay sober? Well, that's giving it away. And and that is my hope that this, what this podcast serves, is that it's going to help me stay sober for sure. And maybe, just maybe, God will work through someone, work through me and work through you. Somebody out there is going to hear it and say, hey, man, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm-hmm. I got a little hope. I want to change. Mm-hmm. I want to change for my wife or my kids, or my mom, or my dad, or whatever it may be. It's, uh, you, 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 you just have no idea how good life can be. So yeah. I am grateful for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. We'll have you next time. Let's do it.